Sponsored Programs Office. And I know we're already behind schedule, so I'll try to you know run through this pretty quickly. Um, what I wanted to focus on for the next five minutes here is just related to policy. Um, a lot of the policies related to grants at NDSU are in Section 8 um, of the NDSU Policy Manual. And I pulled that up here. You can see there's you know, quite a few related to that, to grants. Um, what I did do on the handout is um, highlight some of the policies that we really um, have a lot of questions about. Um, and like I wanted to take just a few minutes on each of these um, just, to, just to add a little bit of info. Again, this is what's on the sheet. It's just um, pieces that are copy and pasted, although you can always go back to the policy for additional information. Um, the first one I want to start with is policy 800, which is the authorized representatives. Um, the VP for research um, or designee is the designated university representative to sign all proposals and award documents. Um, and I wanted to at least highlight that because I know there is confusion um, whether it's a department chair, a PI, um, whoever signing off on a proposal or signing award documents. And um, I've only said, you know, it's better for you not to sign. Not only are you not an authorized representative to do so, you may agree to terms and conditions that you don't want to, whether it's giving away publication rights, IP rights, other things like that. And so that's why, um, like I said, don't sign. If you have questions, please call us, um, because there's a lot of things that we take a look at um, really to protect the work that you're doing. Uh, the next one is Section 801, uh, Grant and Contract General Provisions. Um, and I'll just kind of read this a little bit. Um, all proposals submitted to external agencies must be reviewed and approved by the responsible chair, dean, and sponsored programs. So what that means is that before your proposal goes out to the, spot, to the funding source, it has to be reviewed by all of those parties prior to submission. Uh, section 1.1 talks about the um, responsibility differences between the department and college and then responsive programs, the function review. 1.1 says the completed proposal must be reviewed and submitted by all parties involved in the proposal approval process. The chair and dean are responsible for reviewing the proposal for consistency with the department and college mission, availability and commitment of department and college support services and resources, including faculty time, space, finances, etc. So it's at the department college level to really determine whether it fits within the mission. So then from the sponsored programs level, we are reviewing for consistency with institutional mission and policies, public-private agency policies, applicable federal, state, and local laws. And so again, we're not reviewing from our office content, um, you know, again, with the, you know, whether it's within the mission, uh, we're, just, we're really from our office really looking at the budgetary aspects to see if it fits, again, with NDSU policies, with the sponsor policies. Um, awards, um, as mentioned in um, Policy 800, all award contract agreements must be reviewed by sponsor programs prior to execution. Uh, the, next the next section, restricted gift versus grant policy. Uh, there's always questions wh about whether a particular project should be routed through sponsor programs or not. Um, 803 has a, good, a clear definition related to what is required to go through our offices. Um, one, if the financial support from a, a one, or 1.1, uh, if there's a written document that's been executed regarding the specific use of the funds beyond a programmatic designation. So if there is an agreement signed by sponsor programs and that sponsor. Uh, two, if there's technical reports that are required to be submitted to the sponsor. Three, if a financial report is required by the sponsor. And four, if there's any potential for IP. Um, arising out of that project. So if any of those apply, then it is considered a grant contract, a pro proposal transmittal form is completed, routed through sponsor programs, and then managed on the post award side through grant contract accounting. Um, so if none of those criteria are met, um, and there is a specific section for the egg division, for gifts to the egg division, the egg budget office will first review the documentation 
if it shows that the, it is a gift restricted to a program or speci more specific restriction, it will be classified and, as restricted and forwarded to grant and contract accounting. If there are no restrictions, uh, then it is deposited into an institutional collection fund. Uh, the next section, uh, section 804, allowability of costs. Before a cost can be charged directly to an agreement, the cost must meet all of the allowability criteria below. It must be reasonable. Uh, it must be allocable to the agreement. Uh, it must be considered, must be, it must be given consistent treatment through application of those generally accepted accounting principles across the university. It must conform to any special limitations, exclusions set forth in sponsored research agreement. And then reasonableness. A cost is considered reasonable if the nature of the goods or services acquired or applied and the amount involved therefore reflect the action that a prudent person would have taken under circumstances um, similar. So really in a nutshell what that's saying is that in order for a cost to be allowable, this it must be allowable by the sponsor guidelines and you know a reasonable, you know, prudent approach at it. Um, yeah, okay, and then the last one. No, there's two more. Um, we also get a lot of questions related to subcontracts. Um, whether somebody, something should be considered a vendor, a service contract, or a subcontract. Um, and what the pol policy um, 811.1 states, a subcontract is a formal written agreement issued by NDSU in the performance of a portion of an NDSU sponsored project which will be performed by the subcontractor's personnel <coughs> utilizing its own resources and facilities. A subcontract is only issued for the performance of substantive programmatic work. Um, and of what substantive programmatic work, uh, the definition is a portion of the sponsored project's activities in which the subcontractor has responsibility for decision making and contributes to the scholarly scientific conduct of the sponsored project. So things that would not be considered a subcontract um, if you're, you know, if there's a, you know, private company that does routine testing, um, they're not involved in the publications, they're not doing anything else, they're simply doing that testing, um, that would not be considered a subcontract. What would it be considered? Um, fee for service, um, and those, uh, those agreements then are, uh, are issued through the purchasing company. And the last policy I wanted to mention is 813 um, F&A or indirect costs. Um, by policy, uh, indirect costs must be included in your proposal at our negotiated rate. Um, there is, I won't go through all of the detail, but there is a definition in here related to <coughs> off-campus off -campus activities, because there's a lot of confusion as well, is what's considered on, what's considered off. Um, what our policy says, it says off-campus rates for indirect costs will be used only if the project will be conducted in a remote location for an extended period of time. Um, a project that would qualify for off-campus would be one that would not be used in university facilities for any of the work performed. Um, and it typically, you know, some of the scenarios where that rate is applicable, you know, where I have seen that rate used, um, you know, we've got, for one of the programs on campus, there's an office up in Grand Forks. And so the faculty member, you know, the faculty PI is up there, they run office space, so obviously no work is done on an on-campus facility in that case. Okay, that was um, real quick. Yes? I'm Rochelle Better, and you get lots of emails oh, yes, from me to so see you face to face. <laughs> yes. um, I have questions about once we receive the award letter, as you know, our National Forest <laughs> Council gets confused as far as who they're supposed mm -hmm. to send that to. So should I be sending it to you or Marie when I receive that? The, to me. To you, directly yes. to you. And then, um, okay, because I just feel like sometimes it might bugging you and I should be sending it to someone else over there that manages it before it goes sure. on to you. And we will, um, that will be touching on okay. a little bit later because we do have a flow chart that talks Great. about the proposal process and the award process. Perfect, that's yeah. perfect, thank you. Um, any other questions related to policy? Thank you. Um, I'll turn it over to. Yes. Uh, so are REC's on campus or off campus? 
they're considered off campus uh, because the extension centers, from my understanding, are not included in the uh, are negotiated indirect cost rate base. Those are all. All right, thank you, and I'll turn that over to Kate Sizer. Okay. 